Right? The, the institute is going to have T at 4. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, a day in February in 2007. I was sitting uh, with a friend of mine and colleague, and we were kind of talking about what to do next. We were talking more about what he should do next than what I should do next. And <clears throat> we came to the agreement that uh, that people like him and people like me, that a lot of times we wrote about, we would write about many things, but not economics or political economy. It was kind of like a whole. So <clears throat> we kind of agreed at that point to set out to at least study, start to study the history of these matters because neither of us was very, was very adept at statistics and we weren't ready to uh, enroll in an economics department and uh, become masters of statistics. And we asked around and uh, in asking around, we were introduced to Heinrich Pesch, uh, the works of Heinrich Pesch. Heinrich Pesch is a German Jesuit who also got two degrees, one in economics and one in theology. And he wrote a 10 volume, his uh, lehr book, De National Economie, 10 volume. He, he saw it as like, a, he, he saw it as the economic equivalent of Aquinas' Summa Theologica. <laughs> and he, he wrote it from 1903 to 1925. And so from 2007 till, until I left South Bend in 2014, we we kind of use that book as a way of entering into the history of economics. And the presentation I have today is to introduce Heinrich Pesch. And I thought the best way to do that would be to give a little bit of his view of history, the view of economic history. And I think the way that history, I think that, well, the whole view of his economic history would go back to pagan Rome. And we have to deal with the Reformation, and especially the English. But I think just to get started for today, the first, I think the, we, we want to understand uh, the English, his understanding, or at least an outline, of the English system, and his understanding of the German system. And I think a figure, there's, there's several figures that I think come together in David Hume, uh, that would, we could say, represent the English system. So, the English system, in, in, in Pesh's view, it's a, kind, it's a scientific, philosophical, economic system, you could say. And the first scientists that were promoters of the English system after the Reformation were people like John Dee. John Dee was an alchemist and a magician. He figured out how to... Uh, he figured out how to bilocate using the assistance of demons. So there, there are well, there are there are there are, are moments in his biography where he's where he's communicating both in London and in the Czech Republic, in Prague, with the same people, you know, and supposedly him communicating. But anyway, D was D was the most D was D was an advisor to Queen Elizabeth, and D was one of the first ones to propose in a very kind of alchemical and mythical language, an idea of the British Leviathan, right? The British, uh, kind of laying the basis for somewhat of a, of a system where Britain would rule the waves. Dee had a follower named, named Robert Flood, and at one point there was a, uh, right around this time also, Descartes is, is coming of age on the continent, and you can already see a kind of competition, an, an intellectual competition, if not more, developing between England on the one hand and the European countries on the continent on the other hand. And Descartes' mentor and friend, a fellow named Father Mersen, he challenges Robert Flood, who's a follower of Dee, to a debate about, well, the origin of knowledge, what, what is rational and what is irrational. And at least within the context of this moment, when Cartesian rationalism goes up against John Dee's alchemical, mythical uh, ideas, the, the Cartesians hold, hold, hold sway. Right? They, they, they kind of, uh, they win the day. 
you could say. And they kind of have the upper hand. You could say intellectually they have the upper hand for a century or so until Newton comes along. And, and Newton, I think all, all, that, all that Pesh would see from Newton would be that on the one hand, Newton, because he was kind of a genius and he, he had genuine scientific insights which made advances in science, Newton gives the kind of upper hand, you could say, to, to English science. But there's elements within Newton which are philosophical and which have implications for political economy, which are not so scientific, which are... Newton himself was an alchemist. Some of the biographers of both Newton and Locke will speak about Newton and Locke meeting in Newton's apartment to conduct alchemical experiments. And uh, so Pesh sees Newton as essentially incorporating the philosophy of Empedocles into his scientific system. Empedocles was the pre-Socratic who says you can basically reduce everything, you can reduce all motion to love and strife. <clears throat> and Pesh sees Newton and some of his followers latching on to this to equate gravity with love and inertia with strife. And the idea out of this becomes an idea that if you just let love and strife operate on their own, you'll get perfect circular motion. You'll get a perfect system. And another, th another aspect of Newton that got popularized within England is this idea that, that Newton articulates in one word, right, in one phrase, Hypothesis non fingo. I don't have hypotheses, right? I just observe, and I just observe what happens, and I, I also let things happen. And uh, if you just observe and let things happen, of course, the best will always happen. So, Newton enables, I mean, Newton gives a great intellectual prestige. Yeah, I, I, I think it's not controversial to say his science supplants the science of Descartes or whatever was left of Descartes by the time Newton is, uh, Newton is around. And in a way, David Hume, when David Hume comes on the scene, philosophically you could say he's kind of a... He, he, he levels the playing field. Right? And the one, the one thing that we're going to... Uh, I, I don't want to get caught up in the chess match between, let's say... Hume on the one hand and Kant on the other. But I think it's just, it's just a simple fact, right, that historical fact that at one point Immanuel Kant says, well, there are necessary and there are contingent propositions, right? Necessary propositions are those propositions which are either true or false. Contingent propositions are those propositions which are either real or unreal, right? So you can have either necessary or you can have contingent propositions, but you can't have both. That was the big move that Hume makes in order to lead everybody into philosophical skepticism. Right? So in other words, something can be true or false, something can be real or unreal, but you cannot have any event or thing that is both true and real. This, when, when Immanuel Kant read Hume, right, this, uh, Immanuel Kant his famous quote is that Hume woke me from my dogmatic slumber. <laughs> right? So when Immanuel Kant reads Hume and he sees this dilemma that Hume creates, he spends 11 years mulling it over and he comes up with the synthetic a priori proposition, which he, which he says responds to Hume's dilemma. So he says, you can take a statement, and just to... He says, you can take a statement. Everything that happens has a cause. <clears throat> and you can see in this statement both something that is true and real. And so he thinks that he breaks... The Humean, uh, he thinks with the synthetic a priori, he breaks Hume's hold on the philosophical mind. 
And again, not this is what this is what is seen as kind of his Copernican revolution. And, and Kant, with this insight, he gives new steam. I think Pesch saw Kant as giving new steam to idealism, creating a kind of possibility for the birth of German Romanticism, and creating the possibility of, of a birth of uh, German idealism, and also of a political economy that could rival the political economy that came out of, out of British empiricism. <clears throat> when uh, the political economy that comes out of British empiricism, of course, is the political economy of Adam Smith, right? The wealth of nations, the idea that if you just let competition, if you let people pursue their self-interest in a spirit of competition and you leave things alone, right? Kind of charting, following from the Newtonian paradigm. Everything will come out okay. And the first place where you see kind of a clash between the, let's say, the system of British empiricism and something else, at least as, as far as this story goes, would be the clash between the British and the Scottish after the Jac during the time of the Jacobite uprisings. Uh, Adam Smith himself so in, in 1688, you get the 89, you get the Glorious Revolution in England. After the Glorious Revolution in England, you get all of these conflicts between the English on the one hand and the Scots on the other. The, the Scottish Highlanders are for the most part Catholic. The Scottish Lowlanders are for the most part the Protestants. The Lowlanders tend to ally themselves with the British, with the English. The Highlanders tend to be the rebels. Uh, Mel Gibson, <laughs> Braveheart, <laughs> Highlander, Rob Roy was another movie, book made into a movie about, this, about these clashes. Adam Smith himself, and one of the ways that the, that the English, going back to this time, are trying to create a kind of unity with the Scottish is through intellectual, uh, by giving scholarships or uh, sponsoring, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> sponsoring uh, the scholarship of Scottish intellectuals. So they bring David Hume down to Oxford. They bring Adam Smith to Oxford. Adam Smith is, is in Oxford during the Jacobite uprising of 1745. And at one point, Adam Smith is asked to resolve this problem of the Scottish Highlanders. The problem of all these, un and one of Adam Smith's quotes is, all of these unnecessary mouths that live in the Scottish Highlands. And <clears throat> Adam Smith, when he's thinking about the Highlanders, he reduces it to the drama of the diamond buckles. Because Adam Smith realizes that the Highlanders really, it's a, it's a feudal, it's an aristocratic, barter-based economy. It's very unsophisticated. And all the, all the men, as you can see even in the Highlander movie, <laughs> what, the, what the men really prize <laughs> in the Scottish Highlands are their diamond buckles. <clears throat> and Adam Smith realizes well, you, the way we can pass one of the ways we can pacify the Scottish Highlanders is by getting them into debt, by offering them money so that they can buy their diamond buckles. Then they'll be in debt to us. And then in the system eventually that'll get us to sell that'll get them to sell us their land. They'll have to then their children will have to move into the cities and become workers. Right? And that'll allow us to pacify them and assimilate them. So, <clears throat> this, I mean, I, I mean, I think it's it's kind of clear the, the Scottish, the Scottish uh, didn't the, the Highlanders didn't produce any uh, any intellectuals or a political economy that could rival, at least as far as I know. Maybe someone here knows more than me on this point, but. It doesn't seem like they develop any kind of sophisticated intellectual or intellectual set of ideas or political economy that could rival or give a different emphasis to the British. But I think the Germans did because of Kant. And this is just an outline of <clears throat> some of the thinkers. Not, not that, and again, it's not that all of these thinkers agreed with each other. It's not that, for example, Heinrich Pesch 
Pesh himself had criticisms of almost every thinker on this list. It's not that he thought that any one of these <coughs> thinkers produced a successful system, but he didn't see economics as a system, which is something we'll get into. But what Pesh kind of saw is that Kant, he, uh, what we already said this, he enabled the Germans to, to have the confidence that they could produce ideas. And this is, of course, within the context where there's a great rivalry, there's, there's great criticism of the British system. I mean, just as a for example, if you ever read the, the letters of Thomas Jefferson and John Adams in the 1790s when they're debating whether the United States should ally itself with England or not against Napoleon, against the French, Jefferson is an absolute staunch critic of the English system. And many of his reasons are economic. He's, he basically says that this British economic system is so unjust, we got to go with the French, no matter what problems they might be having, right, in the 1790s, right? Also then in Germany as well, there are thinkers in the 1790s, Kant himself, but some, several Kantians, Fichte by the way, well, we'll get to Fichte in a minute, but there are, there are many Germans that essentially say that following the French or following the Napoleonic system that comes out of the French Revolution, it's got to be better than anything the British can offer us. And so that's why we should stick, I mean, there are also plenty of Germans who are followers of Adam Smith and doing everything they can to convince one of the 300 and some German principalities to implement some version of what, what they understand to be Smith's political economy. But basically Kant, in a way, inspires Fichte Fichte and Kant together, they inspire Adam Müller, who inspired Liszt. Liszt, kind of the experience of Fichte and Müller and Liszt, gives a kind of impetus to this fellow Bishop von Kettler, who, again, we'll go into all these fellows in a moment. And Kettler, Pesch himself, admits his debt and to Kettler, and he also explains in his Lehr book how he's trying to complete what he thinks Kettler uh, started. Smith, or sorry, Pesh, Pesh and his student, a guy named uh, a guy named Nell Bruning, <clears throat> had an influence. They were essentially the ghostwriters of a papal encyclical in 1931 called Quadragesimo Anno, which was an encyclical on economics, written 40 years after the first papal encyclical on economics, Rerum Novarum, 1891. And they, uh, Nell Bruning and his, and his students, they had, uh, they had influence with Conrad Adenauer after the Second World War. Right? So there's, there is kind of a lineage here of ideas that got into an encyclical, that got into the policies of Conrad Adenauer. Another influence from this system, from this tradition, I think you could, you could see in the, in the Wagner Act, in that Robert Wagner, who was a senator in the 1930s, he, was, uh, he grasped the central ideas of Quadragesimo Anno, and for better or for worse, his attempt to implement Quadragesimo Anno led him to be the sponsor of the Wagner Act, which gives us Social Security. So now just to take a step back, to take a step back, Fichte. <clears throat> Fichte was super impressed by Kant in 1790. He goes to meet Kant in person. And what he basically takes from Kant is that it's possible to create a system, and it's possible to create a system that rivals the system that is some confection of new British empiricism and Humean skepticism. Fichte is, con and his great, his, his book, which as far as I know, has still not been translated into English, Der Geschlossene Handelstadt, <clears throat> His book is that essentially we need a state, right? And it's the state, Fichte saw himself as a Republican, 
as a follower of the Enlightenment, as promoting human freedom, right? And he says, but essentially, we need a state. It's the state that transforms individuals into citizens. It's, a, it's the state alone which can transform an indeterminate mass of human beings into a closed whole and can unify in it a universal reality. <clears throat> Ficht deduces from this idea of the state that property, he, he, he kind of goes back to something I think you could get from the Middle Ages, right? That, that that's not a, that he says in the British system, there's an absolute right to property. But he says, but that's not, there, there, there can't be an absolute right to property, right? Property is really, you have a right to property, but you have a right to act. And so he says, my theory is that the first and original possession or the first and original property is the exclusive right to clearly defined free activity. And it's the state that guarantees this free activity. In order for the state, and another book, uh, another idea of his, in order for the state to guarantee the free activity of its citizens, it has to close its borders. Right? Because if it, if, it, if it allows, and his reasoning is if you allow British internationalism to run its course and you never have closed borders, You'll never be able to form citizens, and these citizens won't be able to actually have property that can give them their, that can enable, in a sense, their freedom. So you could say that Ficht proposed no trade as the solution to free trade. Right, now into this mix steps Adam Mueller, and Adam Mueller, on the one hand, he saw himself as a crit critic of Ficht. Fichte. He saw he saw himself as a follower, more or less, of Adam Smith in his criticisms of Fichte. But he also saw he also thought that well, there's got to be something unique to the there is something unique to the German spirit, and he and he he kept from Fichte this idea that the state is important, but he gave it because Mueller is is a uh, is a romantic. I mean, he said the way we're going to discover the true value of property, the true value of the state, is we have to go back deep into our past. And if we go back deep into our fast past, what we're going to find is labor, because Germany, in part, <clears throat> went from being pagan to being Christian because of the Benedictines, and the the motto of the Benedictines was "Ora et labora." <laughs> And the Benedictines, by their thousand-year commitment to Germany, taught the Germans, who were essentially capable of pig farming and hunting, to settle down and work right, in agriculture and then in weaving. And this created the possibility of the state or of a nation who could grow, whose, whose value could grow based on its labor. Now, Mueller gave this a kind of spiritual and transcendent sense. Right? So he, he will, he'll say things along the lines of, only the state can harmonize the vital and spiritual interconnections needed for the moral community. Right? And only the state can unify all of the parts that are within it for the love of mankind. Through this harmonization, the state can acquire a cosmic religious stamp and a universal validity. So Mueller being a romantic, he, he did, he, another contribution of Mueller is, he says money is an idea. Money can only really be backed up by, by the moral authority or the, the moral prestige that the state has. So one of Mueller's ideas is, well, building on Ficta, is that you can't just have international currency. Each state needs its own currency because if money is an idea and property is activity, well, then the state is the one that gives value to those things. The state is what ultimately guarantees those things. List, uh, list not, not Franz, 
<laughs> right? Most most undergraduates that I meet, if I say Liszt, they say, "Oh, Franz, <laughs> the pianist, the Hungarian pianist." Right? No, this is <laughs> Frederick Liszt. So Frederick Liszt was somewhat of a follower of Fichte, and <laughs> Frederick Liszt he had like he was a he also admired uh, Alexander Hamilton and the American system. But Liszt came up with the idea that of the Zollverein, you have to have, if you're going to have a state, I mean, he recognized, Liszt was someone who, uh, from, you know, a after, after the British beat the French in the Napoleonic Wars, right, the first thing that the Germans do, as many countries do in, uh, in, the, in the continental system, is that they open, they open their, their borders to the, German, to the British system. And so from like, from 1818 until 1822, Germany is flooded with cheap British goods, goods. And this leads to a collapse of the economy, massive starvation, and I think it was 30,000 a year start emigrating to the United States. And List was concerned about this. So he went and started, he did, I guess, what we would call now qualitative surveys. But he went and interviewed people who were going... He went and interviewed people who were going to the States. Why are you going to the States, right? Why are you risking your life? I mean, you've heard the story. <coughs> you could get off a ship and you'll be, you'll be freezing and starving to death and you'll basically die, you know, on the streets of Manhattan because there won't be adequate housing for you at the moment. Uh, when I went to New York, right, after, after coming back from Rome, I learned that, you know, in Manhattan, by the late 19th, early 20th century, Manhattan had a density of population on the Lower West Side, more than New Delhi does right now. It was more densely populated right now than New Delhi. It would, and they were, they had no heating, they were living in tin huts, it was really, uh, and most of the people said, well, we're starving here, right? We're starving here and freezing. So, this idea, kind of thinking about Hamilton, the American system was, Germany at this moment wasn't Germany, it was 300 and some principalities. And every principality, in order to go through it, you had to pay taxes. It was the ultimate toll booth system, right? <laughs> and uh, List, List's idea was, well, what we, should, what we should do is we should set up external tariffs, but within, the, within Germany itself, within the German principalities, there should, we should have a customs union. There should be no tariffs for going up and down the rivers of Germany. Now, uh, List was uh, he was thought of as being a kind of radical revolutionary for proposing this idea. So by 1825 or so, he was run out of he was run out of Germany, and he en he ended up in the United States where he, you know, he met he met uh, John Quincy Adams, he met uh, he met Matthew Carey. Matthew Carey was a publisher in Philadelphia. And uh, Matthew Carey went on to write a, a book on political economy, which became fairly popular until about the 1870s in the United States. Between Matthew Carey and this other fellow, Henry George and Alexander Hamilton, I think actually between them, you get, you get a, you'll get a better picture of American political economy, which, which was kind of anti-British. I mean, which was very anti-British up until after the Civil War. Uh, anyway, but List, in creating this idea of, well, we should have tariffs to protect our economy from the British international system, because his basic idea was, if you have industries that are just starting out, if they're going to end up, if they're going to end up competing with, with British goods, there, there's going to have to be a time when these industries are protected in order to get to the scale where they can compete. With a, with a system that's as sophisticated as the British system. <clears throat> In the interest of time, I'll just say briefly, when Karl Marx starts to, be a, to become a critic both of capitalism and of the German political economists that came before him, he was, he was a deep critic of Fichte and Liszt. And one of the reasons he was a deep critic of Fichte and Liszt is that he said that they... They ameliorate the problems of international capitalism, right? So he says, it's mu we're much better off. We would be much better off just 
completely implementing capitalism in Germany, basically so that we see its, bar I mean, this is Marx talking now, so that we see its barbaric results, so that it reduces the proletariat to penury, so that will then make it easy for, easier for us to get them to rise up in, re in rebellion right, against the system. Uh, we don't have time at this moment maybe to go into the Irish potato famine, but I, I think there are so, some, Pesh himself saw the Irish potato famine being kind of an extreme application of the British system that in a sense he thought showed some of the unjust elements within the system given the amount of starvation and death that happened as a result of trying to maintain the sanctity of contracts. Right? <clears throat> this brings us to Von Kettler. Von Kettler, he comes of age in the 1830s. He, up, up until about the time he was 30, he was a lawyer and a politician. He was like Franz Liszt. He was very concerned about em Germans emigrating. And he became very concerned about the worker, the problem of, the of labor. He learned, he, he, he was not like a complete follower of Fichte and Liszt. In some sense, he became a critic of both of them because he said they failed to truly understand economic activity as moral activity. Right? And actually, he would level the same critique uh, against Smith as he would against, ultimately, Fichte and Liszt, that they were proposing systems of economic activity rather than seeing economic activity as a branch of moral philosophy. Right? And he, he was deeply concerned about the, the, the labor question. He also did what we would now call qualitative studies, <laughs> qualitative surveys. He would interview laborers and whatnot. His work, that he, his, uh, his work, I think, which is translated into English, the, la the full title of it, a lot of times it just gets translated as the labor question, the full title he gave to it was The Labor Question and Christendom. <clears throat> By, through a series of personal experiences and also through his, uh, in, in the 1830s, uh, von Kettler, as a lawyer and politician, he objected to the way Prussia was trying to change marriage laws. And he so objected to it, and then also as a result of a personal experience, he he kind of became fully Catholic, practiced Catholicism, and then became a, a priest and then a bishop. So as a bishop in, in 1846, he writes, on, on the labor question or on the worker question and Christendom. He and his followers became influential uh, and, and Leo XIII, who wrote Rerum Novarum in 1891, drew from ideas that von Kettler laid out. Essentially, von Kettler says, if we're, we need to return to seeing economics as part of moral philosophy. If you go back to Aristotle, moral philosophy has three branches. Right? Ethics, which is the moral philosophy of the person. Economics, which is the moral philosophy of the family. And politics, which is the moral philosophy of the city. <clears throat> Von Kettler was also involved in these disputes with Otto von Bismarck, who is unified, who is basically, you could say, in a way, von Bismarck uses the ideas of Liszt, at least economically, to uh, unify Germany. Uh, at the same time, as he's unifying Germany, he at first sees himself as an opponent of people like von Kettler, and he initiates in 1871 the Kulturkampf. Uh, it was it was begun over, over uh, from what I can tell, over whether he basically was fighting over who was going to get appointed to a chair of philosophy at a university in Munich or Tubingen, sorry Tubingen, and basically he realized uh, idea. I mean, he realized on some level ideas are important. I have to get one of my guys to be the chair and not a Catholic. <laughs> uh, this led to many other things. But from 1871, 1876, Bismarck is, you could say, on a cultural level, he's warring against Catholics in Germany in his efforts to unify Germany. 
he is at odds both with people like von Kettler and the Pope. By 1875 or so, also Bismarck is implementing what he sees more as just kind of strict capitalism during this time. Uh, by 1875, he's, re he's realizing that his, that his combination of brutality and people that are, are the, the workers are getting more and more upset, and he's driving people into the Marxist parties, the socialist parties. So by 1875, 1876, he decides, I need to make a deal with the Catholics. And the way, the way he makes a deal with the Catholics, one of the Catholics at this time that he was making a deal with was a fellow named Georg Georg Ratzinger, right? the great uncle of Joseph Ratzinger. Georg Ratzinger was a priest who was super committed to putting an end to child labor. Right? Because according to the laws of the time, child labor, there was no problem. So Georg, actually Georg was so committed to, putting, to writing legislation that would bring an end to child labor that he asked to be, lay, he was a priest, he has to be laicized. Not so that he could like you know go marry somebody, <laughs> but so that he could like be fully committed to in, to ensuring that good child labor laws <coughs> restraints got put into place. So essentially, by by seventy five seventy six, I think Bismarck puts an end to Kulturkampf, and he he cuts a deal with the Catholics, and he basically allows them to implement things like child labor laws, a kind of social security system, a kind of welfare system that protects the worker, that protects labor. That was the essential, I think, the point the Catholics were hammering on it by that point. And <clears throat> Heinrich Pesch is a young man during the Kulturkampf. This is, when he, this is when he comes of age as a intellectual, as a, as a teenager, and as a uh, young man, as a young Jesuit. He goes to Manchester, because in Manchester he wants to both study the British system and what he sees as the fruit of the British system, which is the reaction against it, which is socialism. So he actually studies with Marxists in Manchester. And again, he goes on to write his Lehrer book. And I would say if there's, I mean, the Lehrer book is 10 volumes. <laughs> so we, we, can't, uh, we can't do an exhaustive study of it in the few minutes we have remaining. But I would say that he, in the Lehrer book, he sees, number one, that he says we have to critique philosophically liberalism, right? We have to critique it philosophically because it's philosophical ideas or lack of ideas give rise to political economies which are defective. <clears throat> Whether it's capitalism or, and then I think the second point is he says, and actually he says what, what also Leo XIII said in Rerum Novarum, and also what is eventually said in Quadragesimo Milano, right? That unless, he doesn't see, he doesn't see uh, let's put it this way, he sees economics as both an art and a science. So he, he, when he looks back at, at all these thinkers, whether it's Smith, Newton, Pesch, or List, sorry, List, Fichte, Muller, kind of, kind of when he deals with each figure, he says, okay, what has this figure contributed to our understanding of the science of economics. What has this figure, what has this figure distorted, right? Or what have, what, have, what have we lost in looking at this figure and failing to understand that both the, the nature of the art and the science of economics? And so he says one thing we can learn historically is that unless capitalism resolves its deficiencies, it's gonna to lead to things like, like the socialist or nationalist backlash. And then I think the third point is that Pesch looks at the history and uh, he compares the history of the English system from the, from the German system from 1875 until 1910. And he says, look, if you look at it, his opinion was that if you, his hypothesis, he did have a hypothesis, <laughs> was that if you actually, you look at the British, at the German system, which from 1875 to 1910 gave a kind of emphasis or a priority to giving value to labor, the German system outperformed the British system, which, which de-emphasized the value of labor. <clears throat> and then he would say, I think he would also say that, that the Kaiser made a big mistake when the Kaiser decided to build a navy, right? To try to 
uh, rather than trying to build an economic system that would remain on the continent, maybe working with Russia or Turkey to kind of, because Germany had its own economic problems because Germany always had, uh, Germany could never feed itself as, as a young lieutenant in the German army learned <laughs> at the end of the First World War. Uh, but he said, he, he, I think he thought that, that uh, the Kaiser should have never built a navy so as to try to rival the British control of the international system. That this, this created a kind of rivalry that spelled the end of the German economic system. Kind of that moment that got uh, enabled by Kant and maybe, maybe brought to some sort of political fruition after, uh, after 1875. So that's uh, that's the uh, the elevator speech <laughs> <laughs> of Heinrich Pesch's ten volume uh, <laughs> ten volume lehrbuch.